Big hand praise right there. Come on, give him a big praise. Come on, give him a big praise. Come on. 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 Hallelujah. Look at somebody and say, glory be to God. Glory be to God. Amen. We thank God for the anointing, his presence. We thank God for the 6 p.m. prayer that we've been having. Last week, the second week, somebody got filled with the Holy Ghost. That's a blessing. Hallelujah. Amen. That's not, not just the heebie-jeebies, but the real deal, Holy Spirit. You don't have a lot of those nowadays, but thank God. Look at somebody and say, thank God. I want to read something to you. I'm not going to tell you where this book is or anything like that, because you'll try to copy the anointing of what God has given here. So I'm not going to tell you who the author of this is or anything like that. But I was sitting last week in the dealership getting my vehicle serviced. And as I was reading this part, I'm going to read it to you right now. The Lord spoke to me. I was sitting in the Honda dealership in Vallejo getting my car serviced. And at 2.05 on the 27th, I was reading this paragraph. Now, as I have done the work of an evangelist, and here's my plea, if that is pleasing to God, I have done the work, all right, trusting that I have pleased him, asking for forgiveness for all my mistakes. All my mistakes. Then he may be calling me from the field of, an evan of evangelism to be his prophet. Then if it is, I'll leave an evangelist if I'm to be an evangelist. No, wait a minute. Uh, then if it is, I'll leave, I'll leave uh, evangelism. But if he calls me to be a prophet, I cannot be an evangelist. If I'm to be an evangelist, I cannot be a prophet. You can't maintain two offices at the same time. The only one that has access to all five offices of the hand of God is the office of an apostle. He can function in pastor, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. That the ministry can be perfected. He can function in all five offices as they are needed, as they are needed. That's the only one that can do that. Only one. No other office there can do that. If I'm to be an evangelist, I cannot be a prophet. Cannot be a prophet. About standing, standing on the platform. If it's never been good, successful. Excuse me. It's never been good, successful. God has used it. I, okay, I apologize. I missed a paragraph here. Missed a part. Uh, I cannot be a prophet. I'm mixing the two offices. That's where I've always fussed about. Fussed. I've always fussed about. Standing on the platform. It's never been good. It's never been good. Successful. In other words, it's never been successful to blend the two offices. God has used it, but I've never thought... thought I never thought it was... The, thought thought it was his direct will. It's been his permissive will. His permissive will. Standing on the platform, a vision or two will knock you out almost. A vision. See? And then if you 
tell this person. Now, I want you to hear this real good. Because then I'm going to tell you what God spoke to me while when I read this. And then if you tell this person how to straighten himself up and what to do. And then the next person stands there. He's expecting the same thing. I've had that happen to me. Prophesy to one person and then the very the person next to him, I can feel their spirit. They expected some type of prophecy. There's an expectation there. Expecting the same thing. You can't tell him unless something tells you to tell him. In other words, unless the Holy Spirit tells you to tell him. And then the other people feel like you're a traitor and a backslider or a demon or something because you don't tell them. You don't prophesy to them. You only prophesy to one person. I've had that happen to me. Because you don't tell them what they want to know. See, that's not the office the way a prophet operates. And I read, when I read, as I was reading that paragraph at 2.05 on the 27th, God said these words to me. God said, no matter what happens, God will take care of us. And that was it. No matter what happens, God will take take care of us. No matter what happens, whatever happens, no matter what they unleash, what's loosed, what comes, God said he will take care of us. Now you say, well, why did you, why did you read that to us? We don't see the connection. The connection is the person who was writing this book, they were understanding the importance of being where they're supposed to be. And when you're where you're supposed to be, as God begins to unleash things and allow things to happen, you don't have to worry about nothing happening to you. You can have peace because you're in his perfect will. If you're in his perfect will, God will take care of us. If we are in his perfect will. Now, that's not my message today. I do have a message on that that I want to preach one day. But that's not my message today. No matter what happens, politically, socially, financially, economically, no matter what happens, God will take care of us. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to be easy. That means it's going to be easy, but God will take care. That means it's going to be a bed of roses, and everything's going to go my way, and everything's going to just fall my way. Doesn't mean that. But it means God will take care of us. No matter what happens, God will take care of us. When you have God's word, now, that was on the 27th at 2.05 in the afternoon. I don't know, was that, that might have been last Wednesday or last Thursday, I'm not sure. And then the Lord spoke to us prophetically today. One thing I do, one of the things I will not do, I will never play and manipulate God's people, ever. I'd rather die right now in this pulpit, drop dead, and then mess with God's people like that. That's the truth. When God speaks, he speaks to his people to encourage us, to build us, to give us direction and purpose. Somebody can say amen. amen. Hallelujah. I know the hour is already late. Oh, no, I apologize. That clock is wrong. <laughs> we have daylight savings time now or whatever that is. So that's wrong. Amen. So I do have a little bit of time to talk to you. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. Amen. I thought I was on the run here. So I do have a little bit of time. Somebody said, oh, here he go. He's going to be long-winded today. But that's all right. Thank you, sir. Amen. Now, the anointing is already here. As I usually pray before I minister the word, the anointing is already present. So I'm going to go straight to the word now. This is the third installment. 
of how we are attacked. The third installment, and I believe the final installment. I believe that, but God has the final say. So before I read a scripture, I want to share just a little something with you. Now, when I do things like this, as the Lord leads me, this is not stuff I read out of a book. This is directly from the Holy Spirit to my spirit that I give to you. It's not from another book or someone else's uh, presentation. Being equipped for the Christian battle, because it is a battle. Anybody who tells you that this is not a battle is not telling you the truth. I know some of the major contemporaries of this hour of this day do not say they don't want to tell people that it's a battle, it's a fight, because people's lives are hard enough already. That's their prerogative, that's their choice if they choose to do that. But I choose to stick with the word of God. That's what I choose to do. Being equipped for this Christian battle is essential to survival and success. The best militaries of the world are the ones that have dedicated people first and the best equipment second. Not the best equipment then dedicated people, because you can have the best equipment, but if you don't have dedicated people, the people, it won't, still won't work. You need dedicated people to operate the equipment. Let me give you some examples. Please, follow along with me. Hannibal Barak of Carthaginia. That was around 247 B.C. He was a black man in North Africa. He's considered as one of the greatest military geniuses in history. He led the Carthaginians, which were North Africans, which were dark-skinned people, in successful warfare against the Roman Empire to the point that he marched nearly into Rome. And the only way he was defeated, he was betrayed by his own people his own people betrayed him by, because they were bribed and other things like that, bribed him, and then ran away and eventually assassinated him. But he didn't have the acclaim of the Caesars of the Roman Empire. He didn't have the military capability at the time of his uh, plight with the Romans. The Romans were at their height of their power. They were the power of the world. He was an insignificant man, when they make movies about him, they make him fair complected. He was not fair complected. He was dark skinned. When they talk about him on the History Channel, they make him about my complexion, but he was not my complexion. He was brown or dark skinned. He was from North Africa. They weren't colonized in North Africa at that time. And because of the, the racial thing, they don't want to make it look like a black man conquered Rome. But that's exactly what happened. And I know there's some that are watching on YouTube and everything. And they'll say, how dare he say that? But I'm just going to give you the truth. That's what I'm going to do. A black man conquered Rome and almost had them defeated if it were not for their ability to have money and resources to bribe some of his own people to turn against him. So that's one. His kingdom, Carth uh, Carthaginia, or his land, is modern-day Tanzania. What we know nowadays is modern-day Tanzania in North Africa. Another example is the American Revolutionary War. 1775. They were not the best equipped. They did not have the numbers, nor the military strategy, or the ability of the Britain, British Empire. They did not have all the weaponry and all the tactics that the British had, but yet they defeated them. And America became a sovereign nation. Then, more recently, the Viet Cong in the Vietnam War that lasted over 10 years. To this day, more, more soldiers were killed in Vietnam than the previous two world wars, American soldiers combined in Vietnam. And America lost Vietnam. America was more technologically advanced, weaponry, firepower, technology, everything. Vietnam was a pagan nation that was originally ruled by the French 
They had issues over 100 years and imprisoned the people. Ho Chi Minh, who was the head of the Viet Cong, did not want to fight the Americans. He went to the Americans and was taught by the Americans. He wanted peace. He didn't want, all he wanted was his people to be free. That's all he wanted, Ho Chi Minh. And they, in turn, turned his peace plea into an opportunity to expand democracy in Southeast Asia. And a peasant nation, Vietnam, a peasant nation, defeated one of the two world superpowers at that time. The other one was the Soviet Union. It wasn't Russia then. It was the Soviet Union. And yet a peasant nation was able to defeat America with all of its military might and power and sophistication, was able to defeat it and literally drive the Americans out of Southeast Asia, literally drive them out. We're not in a war with guns and bullets anymore. We're in a war of the spirit, which is far more dangerous. And the Bible says, fear not him that can destroy the body, but fear him that can destroy the body and the soul. All these people that I just referenced you, that was physical warfare or bloodshed. What the war we fight that we've been talking about for the last two weeks, this is week number three, is the spiritual war with the prince of darkness, the ruler of this world that takes no prisoners, that takes no no, 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 no surrender flags. It's either death on his, play, on his idea, either you die or you make it to heaven. He has no in-between. He either wants to completely destroy or you get away and you make it to heaven, one way or the other. The war that we fight now, if ever there was a war that you are fighting, it's right now for your survival. Some people say, I survived the streets. The streets don't have nothing on this war. Nothing. The streets, you know who your enemy is. The kingdom of darkness, your enemy can be sitting right next to you. Your enemy can come into your room at night. Your enemy can come onto your job and set in your mind. Your enemy can sit in the car with you. Your enemy can be in the shower with you. Your enemy can go everywhere you go and invade your thoughts and invade your dreams where you don't have no peace. A relentless enemy. Turn with me to Zechariah in the old book. Zechariah, the third chapter. When you got it, say, I got it. Amen. How many thank God for victory today? Amen. All right. In Zechariah, the third chapter, it says this. And he showed me Joshua 1. Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1 is where we're going to start. And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. And Satan, not a demon, now, remember in some of the other scriptures we read in the past, it talked about, I'll be a lion spirit or this or that. Now, here's Satan himself. It says, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. God doesn't have a right or left, but right signifies the position of authority. Jesus is set down on the right hand of God, forever making intercession for the saints. Satan is here on the right hand, because he has position and authority to be there to accuse and to attack. We've talked about that two weeks ago. Standing at his right hand to resist him. To resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that have chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this the brand plucked out of the fire? Now here, the Lord saying, I rebuke you. Now we'll get into that word rebuke in a minute. In fact, let me just tell you what the word rebuke means. In the Hebrew, it's the Hebrew word gara. And it means to chide, disapproval, scold, or reprimand. 
It means to chide, to disapprove or disapproval, scold or reprimand. That's what it means. So the Lord scolds Satan or reprimands him when he rebukes him. He doesn't destroy him because Satan's got a job to do. So he doesn't destroy him, but he reprimands him. He reproves him. He disapproves of his activities. Now let's continue. Verse 3. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him and unto him. And he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with a change of remnant. I want you to underline that in your Bible, a change of remnant. In fact, put your hand on your chest and say, I need, I need and have received, and have received a, change a change of remnant. Verse 5. And I said, let them set a fair martyr, a martyr, that is a hat. If you want to know what it looks like, when you see the Pope in the Vatican, and you ever see him have that hat that's very high and pointed, that's what a mitre hat is. That's what a mitre hat is. And he said, let him set a fair mitre upon his head. So, that, so they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments. Uh, and the angel... And the Lord stood by. Now, the hat that he wears, meaning the Pope, that's not the hat that the priests wear, but that's similar to what the hat looked like. It's not the same hat. It's similar to what it looked like. Somebody say amen. amen. All right. Now, notice this. Before the new garments could be received, Satan tried to resist the high priest. He tried to stand in between and hold it back and say no. Don't let him have them new garments, the high priest, from receiving what God wanted to do for him. He stood there in opposition. The devil is never going to be on your side. Even when he crowns you with something, he will never be on your side. Even when you get something and you think it's the will of God, but it's not the will of God because it takes you farther from God, then that is Satan crowning you. It is Satan crowning you. Don't tell me that God has blessed you and you have to work every Sunday. You have to work six days a week. You have to work a full-time job, get off that job, do Uber, Lyft, and whatever else, and the wife's got to work two jobs, you got to work two jobs. Don't tell me that God blessed you and that the Lord is blessing you and you got to work like that. I challenge any preacher anywhere to show me in the Bible where that's God. Any preacher. How big they I challenge anybody, show me. Where you got to work a 10 or 12 hour job, hour a day, your wife got to work that many hours, and you got to go do an extra job or side job on top just to keep your car, your house, your money, your clothes, your kid in school, keep your whatever it is, diamond rings, whatever you, gold necklaces, whatever it is, just show me in the Bible where God said do all that. Show me. Show me. There's too many, I know too many Christians personally, personally, that have five bedroom house, three and a half bathrooms or four bathrooms, three car garage, three cars out there, a truck, two nice cars, a swimming pool in the back, all these things, a pool table in the, in the entertainment room, flat screen TVs in every room in the house. He works. 10 hours a day, she works 10 hours a day. Then after that, somebody works a part-time job in the city where they live at, and but come Sunday, nobody got time to do nothing but sleep. And then get up and go to work the next day. I know too many, I know multiple, multiple Christians that have that lifestyle. That is not God. That is not God at all. That's you. You have blessed yourself, and Satan has crowned you. That's what it is. So let me continue. The priest had on garments. He was clothed. But his garments were not appropriate for the promotion that God wanted to put him into. He was dressed and he was clothed. 
And he had on the right stuff, but he was not properly attired to be the high priest. And Satan is there resisting, saying, see God, he doesn't have on the right garments. How can you possibly make him a priest? He don't even have on the right kind of clothes. He don't even have it brown right. How you can't make him a priest. You can't do that. You can't anoint him. You can't do that. And you can't do anything. And notice, all the Lord said was, I rebuke you. I rebuke you. He not only said it once, he said it twice. You know, sometimes you have to contend with the devil more than once. Somebody can talk to me. Sometimes you have to contend with the devil. Well, one little prayer is not enough. Sometimes you have to earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. Sometimes you got to lay between the porch and the altar. And sometimes you got to fight the good fight of faith. And sometimes you got to say, I need to shut in this church for three days and three nights. And I don't need to eat anything. I need to fast until my spine wrap around my stomach because I need to get a hold of God because the devil has been riding my back too much. And there's some new garments that I need to put on. There's some new garments that God is ready to promote me with, but there's a devil that's standing there because the devil is the prince and power of the air, and he's telling all of my business and all the reasons why I, not, I don't have, and the Lord is just simply saying, I rebuke you, and God is invested in me. and say, now, Joshua, what you going to do? Right. Right. Look at somebody and say, Joshua, what are you going to do? What are you going to do, Joshua? And Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him and saying, Take away the filthy garment. Don't you know God know how to wash you up and clean you up? God know how to sanctify you and wash you and down and down. You trying to clean yourself up and fix yourself out and, and go to this and transform yourself. Let God get a hold of you and transform you. You're trying to live this way because you want to please somebody and you want to look a certain way and you want to make it sound good and you want to have all your I's dotted and all your T's crossed and you're trying to transform yourself. The best way to transform yourself is to get on the altar and stay there until God gets you up. Amen. Don't move until God says move. Somebody will say, how long does that take until God says enough is enough? Until God says get up. I remember when I was in the military in boot camp and somebody yelled out and said, how, many, how long we got to do these push-ups? And the drill sergeant said, until I get tired. And he wasn't doing push-ups. We were. He wasn't doing none. How long I got to stay on that altar? Until God says enough. And then when you get off the physical altar, then keep the altar in your heart going. Somebody can say amen. Can I talk to you today? All right. Before the new garments could be received, Satan tried to resist the high priest from receiving what God wanted, what God wanted to do for him. And Joshua's garments and Joshua's garments were not proper for his office. Many times there are things that we have in our life that hold us back from receiving what God has us to have. And Satan knows that we're in a conflict and he knows what type of garment you should have on. And, and I'm not just talking about what kind of suit you wear and what kind of dress you got on. But God knows what type of garment is on your soul. And, and, and Satan knows it too. So therefore he says you don't have on the right kind of garment. So the Bible says give no place to the devil. If my garment is not the right kind, I'm giving place to the devil. If there's something on there that needs to come off, I need to let God take it off. Look at somebody and say take it off. I need to let God take it off. Amen. Hallelujah. For his office, the garments to minister to the Lord must be sanctified. Look at somebody say sanctified. Amen. They must be sanctified. Sanctified. Our garments are of the flesh. Our garments of the flesh should be sanctified. Amen. I know sanctification is not a popular word. I know living holy is not popular. I know people don't like you to say that holiness is right, but the Bible says holiness without no man shall see the Lord. I know people have twisted it and turned it into legalism. That's why you have to have the Holy Spirit so you can rightly divide the word of truth. 
Just because you have a long skirt on down to your ankles don't mean you're saved. Just because you have on a tie and a shirt don't mean you're saved. Because you have on perfume and cologne, that don't mean you're saved and clean. It's the word of God that speaks to you and brings conviction to you and causes you to say, you know what, I need to tighten this up a little bit because this is not in order and I can't have on my priestly garment and minister to the Lord properly, so let me adjust myself some. And I may have to change my way of thinking and change my way of doing and change my way of spending and change my way of watching and looking at things. I may have to alter it a little bit because I need the right kind of garment on. Hallelujah to Jesus. Turn with me to Jude. Turn with me to the book of Jude. Somebody say amen. amen. All right. We read this quickly. We read this quickly. Jude 21. There's only one chapter in Jude. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Keep yourselves. Didn't say God keep you. Say keep yourselves. God, I need you to keep me. No, God says you keep yourself. I'll give you the strength, but you do the work. I'll give you the power, but you handle, you work it out. I'll give you all the tools, but you do it. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Sound like the preacher from Wednesday night. And some of us have compassion making a difference. And others saved with fear, pulling them out of the fire, having the garment. I want you to underline this. Having the garment spotted by the flesh. Excuse me, hating, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. I don't want no spots on me. I don't want nothing on me. I need to get it off. My grandson, he's three years old, but he'll come after he eat and he says, Papa, my hand's dirty. He don't like nothing sticky on his hands. My hand's dirty. I gotta wash my hands. And if he gets stuff on him, he, I, I want to wash this off. That's a good thing. Thank the Lord for that. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank the Lord for that. But he don't want nothing garment, nothing muddying him up. He don't want nothing on his hands. He don't want that type of thing on him. And we as Christians, we don't want nothing that spots us up. You know, you might be a person that, that you, one of those people that, that looks at the mirror and if there's spots on the mirror and you just keep walking by the mirror day after day and there's spots on it, that should, well, uh, it provokes me. Let me say it should provoke you. It provokes me. Everybody's different. I can't just keep looking at the spot day after day, week after week. I got to clean that spot. If a new one gets on there, then that's a new spot. But it's not the same spot from yesterday. That's a new spot that's gotten on there. And our, our soul should be the same way. I have to clean my soul through sanctification of the word of God so I can wear my priestly garment because as I read the word and the word sanctifies me and the word washes me and the word cleanses me and the word purifies me, but coupled with my prayer life, then God washes me and makes me white as snow. That means I'm not guilty. Look at somebody and say, not guilty. I'm not guilty. Now he said... Where we read in Zechariah, he said, the Lord will rebuke the devil on our behalf. And he will rebuke the devil. So now let me, let's add a little bit more to that. Go to Malachi. Most of you could probably quote it in your sleep, but we're going to read it today. Now, my subject matter is rebuking the devil. That's what my subject matter is here. Amen. Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye, ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offering. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that, uh, that there shall not be room enough to receive. Verse 11. And, now and is a conjunction. And, and I will. Who's the I that's talking there? God. Say it again. God. One more time. God. God. I will. 
Rebuke. Remember, rebuke means to chide, disapproval, scold, or reprimand. I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. Not mine, but your sake. And he shall not, now I want you to underline this word destroy. And he shall not destroy. He shall not destroy. He shall not destroy is a powerful word. It's extremely, when something is destroyed, that means it's no longer in existence anymore. It's no longer there. It's gone. It's been completely removed off the map. It doesn't exist. It's destroyed. And he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. He shall not destroy or remove the things that I have blessed you with. He will not do that. He shall not do that. Your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. That means you won't move too ahead of God too early. You won't go too fast, move too quick. We can move too fast in God or we can move too slow. We can miss our window of opportunity in God and then we can move, move too quickly in God and get ahead of God. I've made that mistake many times, particularly in my younger ministry days of moving too fast and doing things too fast and miss the mind of God, miss the timing of God, miss the purpose of God, miss God's hour. And it could be 100% right, 100% what God said, but it wasn't his window to speak it in. It wasn't his time to do it in. It could be 100% God, but that was not his time. He said, you, he said uh, neither shall ye cast, your, you cast her vine, her fruit, before the time in the field. Said the Lord, you will not be premature. You will not be pre premature. Because when you deliver something premature, it may not be fully developed yet. It may not be ready to handle that. You may not be ready to do that. Yes, it's my time to move and it's my time to own a house, but I got to make, make sure I catch God's moment. Is this the house? Is this the season? Is this the time? I don't care what the market says. I don't care if there was a buyer's market and, you know, you need to get it while you can get it and you need to do this while you can do it. If God didn't say do it, I don't need to do nothing. God could have me buy a house in the middle of a, of a, of a famine when everything is going upside down and God said, now buy. He said, but it don't make sense. No, wait a minute. This is a touch of heart. God said, it's my time. I'm doing this. Now buy now. And then God shut up everything, and you end up getting the best interest rate. Everybody else is getting 7%, 8%, 9%, 10%, and you get 1% interest. You get 1%. Everybody else has to put down 10, uh, 40% down or X amount down. You don't have to put nothing down. Everybody else is having to settle for a starter home, and God puts you in a champion home off the bat. The common theory is that you start off in the starter home and then you build your way up. Well, if God, if you got God's timing, who says you got to start in a starter home? If you're in God's timing. He said, the cattle on a thousand hills belong to me. He said, if I say, if I, whatever I bless you with, no man can curse you. And whatever I curse, no man can bless. Here he said, I will rebuke the devourer. I'll reprimand him and say, get off their stuff. Loose their stuff. Loose their property. Loose their time. Loose their season. The devil's setting on your season and binding your season and holding your season. The devil's locking your season in and got your season held down and your season is in a delay pattern and it should be progressing in the Lord. And the Lord said, I'm rebuking for your sake. Get off of her season. Get off of their season. It's their moment to prosper. It's their moment to be blessed. Loose their season. Remember, he's the prince and power of the air, so he controls the seasons. He controls the atmosphere, but then God gets in it and says, now loose that season over him right now. Loose that for him. Get back, back up off of his stuff. Somebody say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Now, who is the devourer or the destroyer? Who is he? Who's the destroyer? Turn with me to Revelation, the 12th chapter. Revelation, the 12th chapter. Twelve and twelve, chapter, chapter 12, verse 3. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. That's the 
Antichrist and his kingdom empowered by Satan. And his tail drew the third part of the stars from heaven. That's the third part of the angels that rebelled and followed Satan from heaven. And did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman. The woman is Israel. Stood before the woman which was ready to, de which was ready to be delivered. For to deliver her child as soon as it was born. Now, if you look at the description of the child that is talking about, it matches the description of the Messiah. Some people say it's 144,000 evangelists and all that. I'm not getting into that today. That's not my point today. But the devourer was right there when the child was to come forth ready to devour, ready to eat up. And the devil, we're in a warfare. He's right there, poised, locked up, locked up, lined up, ready to devour you and me and destroy us. But we must, we must have on the right armor and have the right mindset. So even though he's there, I can defeat him. Even though he's there, I have power over him. Even though he's in alignment, I can still destroy him. Somebody say amen. amen. Turn to Joel in the old book. The book of Joel. In the old book. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. The book of Joel. And we want Joel chapter 1. Hallelujah. Joel chapter 1. Verse 1 says this. The word of the Lord that came to Joel the son of Pethuel. Hear this ye old men and give ear. All ye inhabitants of the land. Have this been your days or even the days of your fathers? Tell your children of it and let your children tell their children and their children another generation. Verse 4. That which the palm of wormeth hath left hath the locust eaten and that which the locust hath, uh, uh, hath left the canker worm eaten, and that which the canker worm have left, the caterpillar have eaten. Awake, ye drunkards, and weep, and how as ye drinkers of wine, because, everybody say because, yes. because of the new wine. The new wine is the Holy Spirit. The Bible says new wine is for new wine skins, for it is cut off. From your mouth. In other words, if your mouth is not right, if you're not right, you can't receive the new wine. You got to be clean. You got to be right. You got to be lined up with God to receive the new wine. But notice how he said these devourers. You had the palmer worm. You had the locust. You have the canker worm. You had the caterpillar. Each one of them is symbolic of a demonic force that divides what one, what one gets through with, another demon is there to take over. When that demon gets done with, another demon is there to take over. When that one's done, that's why demons run in packs and herds. You may be fighting one kind of spirit, a spirit of oppression, but you better bet there's a spirit of destruction along with it. You may be fighting a spirit of, uh, of rejection. You better bet there's a spirit of suicide along with it. You may be fighting a spirit of lust. You better bet there's a spirit of anger right there along with it. They all, what one gets done with you, when lust gets done with you, and you feel cheap and ashamed, then depression is there. That's another spirit. That's like another worm. There's another spirit. And when depression is done with you, then comes suicide. Then when suicide is done with you, then comes death. After one spirit gets done, another one is lined up. And another one and another one. That's why we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers of darkness and rulers of this world. We must take unto us the whole armor of God. Somebody can say amen. amen. When one, you get through fighting one devil, you better bet there's another devil coming around the corner. When Jesus got through in Matthew, the fourth chapter, contending with Satan, the Bible says he left him for a little season. Now, Jesus had to contend with Satan himself. The average Christian doesn't contend with Satan. We contend with a demon. Satan is up in heaven battling with the, uh, doing what he does, accusing us day and night before the Lord. He's making accusation. 
He's going seeking through the earth who he can devour. We battle different demons and different spirits that have assignment. And therefore, because we have assignment, we must be like the militaries that I mentioned in the beginning 45 minutes ago. We must be dedicated and we must be armed and we must be prepared to realize that after I get through fighting one battle, another battle's on the other side. So while I have a little R&R &R time, that doesn't mean let my guard down. That means get charged up in the Holy Ghost. That doesn't mean get relaxed and kick back on the beach with my thong on. That means get full of the Holy Ghost and get ready for the next battle. That means get my energy back, get my spiritual strength back. That means fill my tank up. That means somebody was, uh, was uh, watching a video or heard that Sister Smith and I went on a trip to the south. And they thought that we went on a vacation. They didn't realize we wasn't on no vacation. We was on doing work. We went down to see about her, her and her brother and sister's uh, whatever that land is, the homestead land that it got destroyed in the tornado, not tornado, the hurricane in the flood back in the south in Louisiana. And somebody thought that we was on a vacation when you, we wasn't on no vacation, we was doing work. Because I'll be honest with you, this is not the time for vacations. And if you do go on a vacation, it's going to be a working vacation. What you mean by that? I'm going to pray and I'm going to fast even though I'm on vacation. I'm going to read my Bible even though I'm on vacation. I'm going to have some type of prayer or some type of something even though I'm on vacation. Amen. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you today? Amen. Amen. And right now you can go on a cruise ship if you wanted to anyways. Hallelujah. Did you somebody say, uh-oh. All right. Now let me give you one more to seal it up here with this particular point. Daniel, the seventh chapter. Daniel, the seventh chapter. If the Lord do bless you to have a little getaway with your loved one, then enjoy that getaway. But just stay spiritual while you're on that getaway. Amen. If you do get two, three days to spend, if you're married with your spouse or you get holiday season, you get to spend some time with your family. Just stay in the Holy Ghost, in the anointing. Amen. Don't get too carnal where you can't hear from God Amen. and let your guards down too much. Amen. It's all right to spend time with family. It's all right to enjoy your, if you got a spouse. It's all right to do that for a couple of days, but just don't get out of control and then you miss what God is saying and then the devil will pounce thee in two. Right. Don't think the devil will take a break just because you go away for a weekend. Right. Then all of a sudden he decides, you know what, I'm going to take a time out and wait till they come back from their getaway and then we'll start back up when you get back. <laughs> That's why sometimes when you come back from the getaway, you would be like, now why it seems like all hell broke loose? This done gone wrong, that done gone wrong, the pipe in the wall bust in the house, the car's on a flat tire, my grown adult kid, what is y'all doing? Why, what, what is this? Because the devil don't take breaks. Oh, nobody's saying nothing to me there. Hallelujah. Or oh, you get back to a whole bunch of phone calls and texts, such and such as the hospital, such and such this, and you're like, oh, my goodness, because the devil don't take breaks. We take a break, but just stay in the spirit of the Lord. Keep the mind of Christ. Say amen, somebody. All right. Daniel, the seventh chapter, verse 25 says this. And he shall speak great words against the most high and shall wear out the saints. Look at someone say, that's us. That's talking about the Antichrist. And he shall speak great words against the most high and shall wear out the saints of the most high. And to think to change times and laws and should be given into his hand until a time's time and a dividing of time. In other words, he's going to have the power to do that. He's going to have the power to change the, the calendar, the power to change times and seasons. He's going to have that ability and he's going to wear the saints out. But if you got God inside of you, you will be able to stand. You will be able to hold up. God said, he told us early in this service that I will strengthen you. I will cover you. I will bring you through. I will fight for you. I will bless you. I will cover you. I don't have fear. Because fear has torment and God don't bring torment. Yes, he will wear the saints out. Yes, it will be a constant battle. Yes, we will be fighting all the time. But we'll also do great exploits and the power of God will be in our lives. And we'll resonate the anointing. And we'll show forth the glory of God. And we'll stand up above the trial. That's why people will say, why are you not crying? Why are you not boohooing? Why are you not running? Why are you not backing down? Because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Because my God has strengthened me. Because the joy of the Lord is on the inside. The joy is building me up. The joy is... Is bringing me through I can stand in an evil day because God is comforting me and building me that's why 
Look at somebody and say, that's why. The devourer being rebuked by the Lord. He, God has given us a blueprint. Look at somebody and say, God's given you a blueprint. God's given you a blueprint. You got to learn, and I got to learn. We got to learn that when frustration come and anger come, that's the devil trying to get you out of your position. When frustration and anger, I don't care if it's with your wife, your husband, your kids, whatever it is, it's the devil trying to get you off the mark. It's the devil trying to get you out of your position so he can get a hold of you and deceive you. And you have to recognize this is the devil. I'm not going to let you steal my joy. They may be acting up. It may be me acting up, but I'm not going to let you do this one. I'm not surrendering my joy. I'm going to take a step back. If I got to shut my mouth and be quiet, then let me shut my mouth and be quiet. I was talking with somebody the other day. And then yesterday I had a testimony. I was talking with somebody the other day. And they was going through the drive-thru. And the lady through the drive-thru got real snappy. I could hear him on the phone because I was on the, they were talking to me on their car phone. And I could hear him responding. And the lady in the drive-thru got real snappy, snappy with him. And the person said, oh, no, oh, no. I don't work too hard for this anointing. I'm just going to get out of this drive-thru line. And I'm going to go on and go somewhere else. I'm not going to let this rob my anointing. And you have to have that mindset. The person behind the corner, the counter, they want to act stupid and all this. Oh, no, 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 no. Let me just get right on out this line right here. And I'll go over here in this super long line because I'm not going to let this take what God has given me because I've worked too hard to get what God has given me. I've spent, no, 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 you're not going to get that. Devil, you're not going to rob me like that. Brother Eddie and I was somewhere yesterday, and we were doing some things, and we looked at each other, and we both, was like, we both looked at each other. It's like, it's time to get out of here. I said, yeah, Pastor, it's time we need to get out of here. And we exit stage left and got out of there quick because it got too hot up in there. That's all I'll just say. It just got too hot in there, and we needed to go because the devil, we're not going to lose what God has given us. Amen. Hallelujah. I didn't forgot yesterday was Halloween. I'm being honest. I got as my witness. I forgot. I didn't even know yesterday was Halloween. And I kept wondering why. I was like, why are all these people dressed like this? This is a God truth. He was with me. I said, this is, I said, why are these people dressed like this? What is this? I said, it's not Halloween yet. And he looked at me and said, yes, it is. I said, oh, there it is then. And about two, three minutes later, we looked at each other and said, we need to get out of here right now. And we got, we exit stage left. I had totally became oblivious that that was Halloween yesterday. And I don't know why everybody want to dress like what they dress on Halloween, but that's between them and God. That's all I'll just say that. People need deliverance. They need prayer. I need prayer. What about you? All right. Amen. Let's look at this blueprint. Turn it to James, the fourth chapter. Hallelujah. That's why the Bible says two are better than one. I'm a loner. No, you need to have you a Jacob with you. You need to have you a Joshua. You need to have somebody. I'm talking about I'm a loner. I like it by myself. The devil sets you up. A three-card strand is not easily broken. The Lord knows what he's talking about. Everybody needs somebody. You need, there's two relationships you need to have in your life. And hear me good before I go to this next scripture, because I ain't got but one after this. There's two relationships. You need a vertical that's the one that's spiritually, the little higher, the little more seasoned, the more anointed. They're, they've got a little bit more seasoning with God. You need that. That's your vertical. Then you need at least one horizontal. That's somebody that's about the same level. And that person there, that's the person that you go to the ball game with. If you go to ball games, oh, you do what you do with. That's that person. But that horizontal one or that vertical one, that's the one that helps keep the checks and balances there. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying to you? That's the one. Everybody needs those two relationships in their life. You're blessed if you got a couple of them, but you need at least those two. Say amen. amen. All right. Amen. James, the fourth chapter is where we are now. James, the fourth chapter. Now, this is your blueprint. This is your blueprint right here. This is it. Look at somebody and say, this is my blueprint. James, the six, chapter 4, verse 6. But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth, that means ongoing, the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. If I got an issue with pride, God's going to resist me. 
If I got an issue with pride, God's going to resist me. You don't want God to resist you. You want God to embrace you. That's what you want. You don't want God to say, get back. You want God to say, come close. But he giveth grace, excuse me, he giveth more grace. Wherefore, he said, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit, everybody say submit. Amen. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. That's one act. That's one act. That's not two separate things. It's one act together at the same time. It's one act. There's no and. It says, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. There's no and in there. It says, read it again. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. It doesn't say, it doesn't say and then resist the devil. It says, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. One act. I submit to God at the same time, simultaneously, I'm resisting the devil. It's kind of like chewing gum and breathing at the same time. You do it both at the same time. My life is submitted to God, and at the same time, I'm in the position to resist the devil. If I'm not submitted to God, then I'm not really resisting the devil. Or if I try to resist the devil, I really don't have much to stand on. I don't have much ground to stand on. I have to be submitted. Look at somebody and say, submit. Amen. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh. Everybody say, draw nigh. Draw nigh, draw nigh to God. Come close to God. Don't try to get farther away from God. Well, I, I, you know, I, you know, I, you know I, if God get too close to God, he's going to ask too much. He's going to want too much. He's going to want me to do this. He's going to want me to do that. No, get close to God. Let God ask you. Let God want more from you. Let God get more out of you. Let God pull more out of you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Pull close. Run to God. What did Moses do when he seen the burning bush? Did he run from it, or did he say, behold, I see a bush burning but not consumed. Let me go investigate. Let me get close. And then when he got close enough, the Lord said, now take your sheet off. Take your shoes off. You're about to step on holy ground. <laughs> He didn't go the opposite way and say, ooh, that's scary. I'm gone. I'm out of here. He went the other way and said, no, I need to see what this is. I need to see what's going on. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. You can't be double-minded and hear from God. Got to have your mind together. You double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep, and let your laughter be turned to mourning. And your joy to heaven. What that simply means, ladies and gentlemen, it just simply means this. Separate yourself from the world. Don't allow yourself to be entangled with the world. Don't allow the world to dominate you and control you and possess you and lead you. Pull yourself. The world, hold it, the world is more than watching pornography. The world is more than watching too much football, baseball, basketball. The world is more than watching too much Home Network and Oprah Network and BET Network and Showtime Network and HBO and ABC. The world is more than that. The world is anger. Be separate from anger. Don't let yourself walk in anger and bitterness and unforgiveness and hatred and all these types of things. Don't let yourself be consumed with that. Be free from that. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying to you today? Be separate from that. Anger is in the world. Bitterness is in the world. Unforgiveness is in the world. Hatred is in the world. Be loose from that. That's why we shouldn't be out there marching, talking about resist and this, in this and in that. That's the world. Amen. We're the light of the world. Be anointed with the power of God. Amen. Be anointed with the power of God. So if you, I guarantee you this, I can promise you this. If you got full of the Holy Ghost and you're anointed with the power of God, you can run and walk in front of a, a Ku Klux Klan and you can walk in front of the black Hebrew light and because the power of God is in you and anointing is on your life, they both going to get convicted. 
they both going to get delayed. He can have on his white robe with the hoodie, and they can have on all the other garb that the, the black Hebrew light wear, all that, because you got the Holy Spirit and the power of God inside of you. If the kings in the Old Testament, and if, the, if, if Pilate said, I wash my hands, I don't see nothing wrong with this man, I don't see no problem, then why in the world can't God get full of the Holy Ghost in your life and a clansman get convicted and saved? Why can't they get saved? Why can't somebody that's in another belief or off belief, why can't they get convicted and saved? Because there's so much power and anointing in your life. Amen. That the power of God gets around to either they say, you know what, I need to leave and get out of here, or tell me something about this Jesus you serve in. Let me tell me something about that. Somebody can say Amen. That means just separate yourself from the world. Don't get bound up in the world stuff and tangled up and bound up and I got to get with this group and I got to do this and I got to do that and I got to get mine and I got to be like this. No, 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 no. Separate yourself from all that. You're in the world but not of the world. Live your life unto the Lord. Live unto God. Serve God. Love God. Worship God. Put God first. Be consumed with God. God in the morning. God in the noonday. God in the midnight hour. God in the shower, God in the kitchen, God in the car, God at work, God everywhere. 100% of the time. Hallelujah to Jesus. Five points. He says he'll give you more grace. That comes with humility. He says to submit yourselves to the God, to God, and the devil will flee. Number three, he says draw close to God. That's number three. Get close to God. Look at somebody and say get close to God. Then he says, cleanse, your, uh, cleanse or cleanse your hands and be pure. That just simply means be pure. The Bible says to the pure, all things are pure. Number five. Number five is the Greek word. And, and the Greek, it means to separate from the world and to consecrate. Yes. To separate and to consecrate. Not like David, Koresh, and all them and go have a compound and do all that and then be on little group of people. If, that, if that's the case, then nobody's going to see the light. The light, light is for darkness. We're light in darkness. God will keep us and God will comfort us and God will protect us and God will strengthen us. Somebody can say amen. Now I'm not saying be presumptuous or be an idiot. I'm not saying that. Excuse me for saying idiot. But I'm not saying be presumptuous and say, well, I got God on my side so I can just go walk out here into this dean of thieves and I'll be okay. You're going to get whooped. But now if God tell you to go and walk in that den of thieves and his anointing is there with you and you got the Holy Spirit, somebody's going to get saved. But just don't be presumptuous and say, well, I got God so I can just do whatever I want to do. You're going to get in trouble that way. My last one for today, Romans. Last one for today. Somebody say amen. amen. I know they don't preach and teach like this no more, but that's all right. I'm a relic. That's what I am. Just call me Mr. Relic. That's what you call me, Mr. Relic. I had so many people say, tell me, how old are you? And then I tell them how old are I am, and they say, you talk like you're about 70 years old, 80 years old. And all I can say, that's God's doing, not mine. That's all I'll say to that. That's God's doing. When you want to be close to God and God, you want to walk with God, God will mature you Amen. beyond your physical years. He will grow you and develop you. That's why he said, draw nigh to God. Romans 13, as we close out. And 11. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. That's not getting a good sleeping at nighttime. For now is our salvation nearer than we believed. It's the hour is later than what anybody thinks it is. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us, therefore, cast off the works of darkness. And let us put on the armor of light. You cannot, I cannot, we cannot have light and darkness at the same time. One or the other has got to be on there. Let us. Walk. Now, I love how he's saying this. Let us, not let you, let me, but let us. Let us walk honestly, honestly, as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, 
not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. Now, in the Greek, that phrase or same to be clothed with, uh, to be clothed, in Greek that phrase means to take upon the interest of another, to enter into his views and be holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy on his side, imitating, imitating him in all things. Did you catch that? Let me say it to you again. In the Greek, this passage of scripture, 14, means this. To take upon the interest of another, the other would be Jesus, to enter into his views, that would be Jesus, to be holy on his side, that would be Jesus, to imitate him in all things, that would be Jesus. To cast off everything else and fully embody Jesus. Christ, fully embody him in everything we do and say, in every aspect, in concluding this series, which is the conclusion today, in order to be an effective soldier for the kingdom of light, we must completely remove everything that is the armor of this world and take upon us the armor of light. The armor of light. To transform from the world to the armor of light. Well, when we baptize, you know, some of you guys didn't like it because the water was cold, but you'd be all right. Didn't went down, and there was a part of your body that was not submerged underneath the water. And I said, nope, got to dunk them again. And I know the water was cold. But unless there was a complete submersion under the water, everything, every finger, every hair, every part, every single part, because it's symbolic of taking on his death, you don't partially take on his death. You're either completely buried or not. So if one hand jumps up there, you're not buried. Put it back down there again. Go back again. It must be complete. That's why everything God does is complete. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you today? Everything God does is complete. It's absolute. It is complete. And when God has begun, the scripture says, a work in us, he is faithful to complete it to the day of redemption. So if God has started the work in you and is equipping you to be a soldier for the last day, for the evil day that we're in, which we are in, and Satan's going to wear the saints out, you would be behooved, it would behoove you to get all of God you can get. It would behoove you to sacrifice. It would behoove you to turn, your way, to turn away from the things of the world and say, let me get all of God that I can get. It would behoove me to leave frustration alone. When frustration comes, let me try to find somewhere else. The Bible says we have a hiding place in him, so when frustration comes, let me get into my hiding place. When aggravation comes, let me get into the secret place. Y'all hear what I'm saying to you today? The armor of light. Satan can transform himself into an angel of light. And if we don't have on the armor of light, we'll think we got on the same armor he got. We'll think we got on the same thing he got. We'll think he's our general and he's leading us because he has an armor of light too. And because I don't have the Holy Spirit, I think, well, since, that's, since he's light, then I'm light, then, we, then, we, then, then that must be God. So many Christians say, well, this happened and that happened, so it must be God. Show me that in the Bible where one person said, succeeded in God like that, where they said, it must be God. It either is God or it's not. There's no halfway about it. It either is or it's not. When the Lord spoke that very simple 
sentence to me in the car dealership last week. There was no spectacular revelation like these people do. They say, oh, oh they got long dissertations and God showed them all this. It's mighty funny. A lot of times these people, they have all these dreams and visions. They're talking about things that either A, already happened, or B, somebody that's not really that spiritual could kind of put the dots together. And, oh, I can see that happening. I can see that happening. I can see that happening. Oh, I can see. Hmm, doesn't take much to figure out. Well, you know, I see, I see ashes over California and all that. Well, we are in fire season, and we do have a history of fires here in California, and ashes do fall in the sky. So it has been like that for the last year. So it don't take a lot of spiritual discernment to figure, hmm, was that God or what was that? That, you know, that's pretty rational thinking. You don't have to do a lot to figure that part out. Not a whole lot. You don't have to do a whole lot. Now, that's a whole other thing. If you say, God showed me, and I see the Santa Rosa, city of Santa Rosa burning, and I seen from street A to street 37 burn, and I seen 75 houses burn, two houses with the fire missed, but it burnt these houses. Now, that's different. That's different. That's different. But again, we must have light. Everybody say light. light. To fight this devil. To defeat this devil. You are armed or you have the ability to be armed to win the battle. The only reason a Christian, hear me good, loses a battle now is because they allow it to be lost. The devil can't steal because God has given us weapons of offense and defense. He's given us the ability to fight back. He's given us that. We must fight every inch of the way. Every step of the way. You're going to fight until you step into glory. And that's why Paul said, I've fought the good fight of faith. I've ran my course. I'm ready to go now. I'm ready to leave. Look at somebody and say, it's going to be a fight. But let's put on the armor. Let's stand in the evil day. Get before God in, in your house. Make you an altar in your house. Make you an altar. Make you a sanctified place in your house. Don't let corruption get in there. There's some of you, the Lord has blessed you with cars and you've let the wrong kind of stuff go on in your cars. You need to re-sanctify your car. Re-sanctify your car. And as you let somebody borrow your car, say, listen, don't do that in here. If you're going to borrow this, do not do that here. I'm grown. I do whatever I want to do. This is my car. If I get in my car and I smell this, that means I didn't put it in there. You put it in there. And if you do it, then don't ask me to borrow my car no more. Well, how am I going to get to work? Well, you need to think about that then now. That's what you need to do. You need to think about that. All I'm asking you to do is just don't violate my car. That's all I'm asking you to do. You do whatever you want to do when you're in your space. That's between you and God. But in there, don't do that. Because if I get in my car and I smell it or I see it laying there, that's the last time you'll drive this car. That's the last time you'll be in here. Oh, that ain't right. Uh, you ain't being right. I'm grown. I'm gonna, you are also grown, and that's why there's a bark train for you. You are very grown. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. But you're not going to do that here. I'm being kind. I'm blessing you. Now, you be kind and honor me. Everyone bow your head. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, bow those heads. Praise your name. I want to say thank you to all those that may have been watching via internet and all that. God bless you. If we're here, we'll be back again on Sunday. If you want to be a blessing, there'll be some instruction on how to do that. You can't help but be blessed if you sow into God's kingdom. God bless you for those who are watching. Amen. And everyone here, I want you to just bow your heads right now. Come on. Hallelujah to Jesus. Come on, bow those heads.